Hi, Sri. Thank you very much for joining us today. You are a portfolio manager at Sprout Asset Management, and you and your firm are very bullish on the energy transition movement. And this movement will require a, a lot of different metals, including copper. And this is where I want to focus our discussion today. And maybe we can just start with why you are so bullish on copper. Well, like with most commodities, the reason to be bullish or bearish on a commodity all comes down to one thing, which is a supply-demand balance. And as it relates to copper, we have seen the, the amount of mined supply of copper uh, be, remain around the 2021 million tons for the past five or six years, uh, while the amount of lease cycle supply that's been entering the market has been somewhere between three and four million tons per annum, whereas the demand side of things uh, has continued to pick up. And this year, for example, we'll likely find ourselves uh, on, on the razor's edge of, of supply barely meeting the demand. And as we progress through the years, we're likely to see demand for copper grow by around half a million tons per annum um, conservatively, or could be even higher. And for this reason, it is very easy to be bullish on copper, especially as the demand side of the picture is concerned. Uh, when we look at the supply side, there are not a lot of new mines that are coming on stream. Uh, a lot of producers are really struggling to maintain their production. So we're going to be looking at a scenario where the world needs more copper, the mine, the miners want to mine more copper, except they can't really mine more copper. And so we're going to have a scenario where supply is, is just not going to keep up with the demand for copper. So for that reason, we're quite bullish on copper. And you raised a couple of elements here that I want to hone in on, and the first one being demand. A lot of this has to do with this movement toward electrification and also EVs. EV sales in 2022 was 10 million versus 6 million the year prior. And of course, this is going to require a lot of, of copper. So maybe you can just touch on that and the growth in the EV sector and how this is going to impact copper. Sure. The, the amount of growth we have seen in electric vehicles has been quite phenomenal. Uh, last year alone, like I said, uh, around 10 million electric vehicles were sold around the planet. And what many people uh, are, are just now starting to begin to realize is just how much more copper goes into EVs. Uh, a typical EV needs somewhere between three and four times the amount of copper uh, versus a traditional gasoline-powered vehicle. Now, where things get really interesting is that EVs don't just drive themselves. They need electricity to drive themselves. And in order to have the infrastructure uh, be there so that people can drive their EV from point A to point B and be able to charge uh, it somewhere in between once or, once or more, uh, you need to have all these charging stations set up. And all these charging stations and the associated infrastructure uh, require quite a bit of copper uh, just to kind of lay it all out and, and have it be there. So for this reason, the amount of uh, copper that's going to be uh, taken up by this whole electric vehicle movement or, or really the revolution that's underway is, is going to catch a lot of people by surprise and it's uh, probably going to catch many uh, countries and, and, and some companies even uh, to be on a little bit flat-footed. Uh, and the same thing can be said about uh, a lot of these uh, electricity uh, producers as well. They just won't be able to keep up with it. You also made a comment earlier about the geopolitical situation and how that will impact the copper supply. And the two largest producers of copper are Chile and also Peru. Maybe you can just touch on how important these two countries are in terms of global production and what's happening there in terms of the geopolitical situation. So right now, uh, like I said before, the total amount of mine supply uh, coming out from all the countries around the world is around 20, 21 million tons per annum. Out of that, Chile represents 5.5 million tons per annum, give or take. And then we have another 2.5 million tons of supply coming out of Peru. So the number one and number two um, countries or, or producers of copper put together are putting out around 8 million tons of, of supply versus about a 20 million uh, ton of total global mine supply. So it's quite easy to see how why these countries are as important as they are for the for the copper uh, supply chain. Now, what we have seen recently is uh, a couple of things happen. So in Chile, for example, um, there have been there has been, um, I guess, 
a little bit of uh, interest from from the government to try and increase the taxes that the, the copper industry pays, uh, as well as try and lift the royalties. Uh, this all was going on over the last couple of years, um, and and thankfully the changes that were made uh, to the for the for the taxes that the copper producers have to pay uh, were relatively modest, and and the impact as a result was not that bad. But uh, more recently, the same the same government out of Chile has tried to uh, make some noise in the lithium space, so they want to try and. Uh, bring uh, or, or actually nationalize some of the, the lithium projects that exist in Chile, for example. Um, so it, obviously this sort of rhetoric uh, is is something which can cause a lot of investors to feel uneasy and that type of uncertainty and the unease that it, uh, exists makes it more likely for producers or, or developers that are looking to fund their projects uh, to be less likely to put the, the big capital outlays that are necessary to build new mines. So that's uh, the picture for Chile. Now, s- stepping over to Peru, uh, in the last few months, and this has been making headlines, there have been plenty of uh, social uh, unrest all across the country. Uh, this is as this is linked to um, previous president that was uh, that was removed from office, and there have been spontaneous uh, protests that have been. That have been emerging out of uh, various different parts of Peru, uh, lots of clashes, lots of uh, violence between the authorities and protesters, and this all has a very negative impact on the mining industry because the protesters have been trying to, uh, I guess, uh, they've been trying to make uh, it more difficult for uh, goods uh, and equipment to be able to move from point A to point B, and the mining sector especially has been quite heavily impacted. And then, of course, there was also the situation in Panama with First Quantum. Yeah, First Quantum has made a, a substantial investment in Panama to try and bring Cobra Panama uh, into production. And, and there was a very long, protracted, and intense negotiation that took place within, between the government and, and the company to try and come to terms um, as to how the profits that are generated from this mine uh, will be shared between that. Uh, private corporation and and the government. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. The governments are always trying to take more, aren't they? It's 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 just kind of name of the game. You know, anytime there's any material left in, in the price of any given commodity, um, if there are one or two outsized years of profits, the, the tax man comes. So we talked about how the supply might be disrupted. But let's also talk about the demand side. And China is the world's largest consumer of copper at approximately 60%. And now that China is opening up again, what do you think this will do to the copper price of anything? So China has been reopening its software for the past several months now. What we did see happen is uh, for some of the commodities that China typically has uh, stored in its warehouses, that the, the inventory levels have been drawn down. And we have seen this happen with uh, copper as well. So China has been quite busy restocking. And as, as they kind of quote unquote reopen and as they try to stimulate their economy uh, to get it to grow the way the government uh, wants it to grow, we'll likely continue to see increased amount of uh, capital make its way into infrastructure projects uh, and, and other type of uh, stimulus measures, all of which are going to be quite beneficial for copper. So that's a great overview of the supply and demand side of the equation and how that might impact copper, the copper price. Now I'm curious how you and your team value copper equities, and maybe you can just give us some idea of the analysis that you do on a producer versus a developer. So it's quite important to just uh, for us at least to try and uh, think about companies depending on the, the life stage or the life cycle that they're in. Uh, as it relates to exploration companies and developers, they don't have any cash flows, obviously. Uh, and, and as investors, we are oftentimes trying to figure out how much dilution uh, we have to deal with on the equity side or uh, how much debt these companies will have to take on in order to bring their production, bring their projects into production. Uh, so as a result, oftentimes we will value developers much more um, 
onerously or or, or a bit more conservatively to speak uh, put it this way uh versus a producer producers have existing cash flows their cost profiles that are very well understood uh and and so as far as producers go we are t- typically using um more of uh analysis trying to try and figure out what the net asset value of the project is uh, what do they? What, what type of cash flows can be expected? Uh, various various copper prices, um, and we typically have a relatively decent amount of visibility uh, on their cash costs, bringing this copper out of the ground and and uh, into a form that is useful for the end user. So uh, producers are typically valued more or less on 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 the basis of their cash flows, on the basis of the NAV, uh, and for exploration companies and developers, you're trying to do a similar level of analysis, but with less visibility because we don't really have a great window into what their actual cost will end up being like or when the project will be in production. And what copper price do you and your team use to value copper equities? So the price of any commodity that we use for analysis of any company really uh, is, is more or less close to spot prices because we typically try and not take a view as to which direction the price of the commodity is going to move. Um, we try and look at things as they are um, today. The only scenarios where we will use prices which are different uh, from the prevailing prices of uh, commodity is when we have seen a sharp increase in the commodity where maybe a, a stronger element of conservatism is warranted, or if you're seeing a sharp, uh, a sharp decline in the price of a particular commodity, in which case it's okay to be a little bit more optimistic as to where the commodity can go, but generally speaking, we use uh, we use the prevailing uh, metal prices. And how does the current valuation of the copper sector compare to historical valuations? Do you do you and your team see good value in the sector right now? So, if you look at how uh, the, the the sector, and I'm talking about uh, the copper producers today, and there really aren't that many. Uh, and if you compare where they trade today in relation to uh, the past 10, 15 years, uh, you'll see that the the valuations have more or less remained in a, a particular range. If you look at it from an EDB DAW perspective, if you look at it on a price to cash flow perspective, and the valuations that we see today are not, and I'm talking on a, on a general level, are not completely different from where valuations have been for the past decade or so. Uh, but where we see value is in, uh, it's on a name by name basis. So it'll be in a, in a producer, for example, where we can see significant amount of my life extensions coming, which are perhaps not priced in it. Um, we, we can see value in, in certain producers that are perhaps being um, punished unfairly because of a poor quarter that was put out. And, and we try and take a longer term view on things. So. Uh, I would say there there is certainly value to be had in this space, uh, but it really is is a function of uh, doing the work and and trying to figure out which particular uh, security is is the one that should be um, bought. Sri, you brought up a very good point in that there really isn't a whole lot of copper producers out there. One of the reasons is because we've seen so much M and A in this space. Just in the past year, we saw Rio Tinto come in and buy Turquoise Health. And we also saw BHP earlier this year buy all his minerals. Hud Bay is currently buying Copper Mountain. And of course, there's been numerous overtures for tech resources. What are your thoughts on what's happening with M&A right now? And do you think this is going to continue? I think M&A in pretty much any commodity uh, that you let me look at, it is going to take center stage every so often uh, during the commodity cycle. Um, right now, like I said before, we are staring down a potential supply demand imbalance with supply just not being able to keep up uh, with the demand. And a lot of the copper producers today see that as well. And, and for that reason, they're just out there trying to buy whatever supply that they can uh, for 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 a price that they view as being quite opportune. So uh, will there be more m in, in the copper space? Uh, I, I would suspect so. Uh, I mean, there's very little reason to believe why there wouldn't be any uh, more M&E. Um, the one couple of things that I'm also seeing right now is for uh, producers uh, these days to try and maybe, uh, I mean, depending on the producer in question, but more and more producers these days are trying to uh, focus their M&E in, in more 
safer jurisdictions uh, where perhaps the like Hud Bay and Copper Mountain, like you uh, just pointed out, uh, where the production is actually coming from countries with a very stable jurisdiction, with a very stable tax code, uh, and where the red operating risk from social economic perspective is quite minimal compared to some of the more, uh, I guess, uh, jurisdictions that are still developing their mining industries. So I think that theme will likely play out where uh, producers look to buy pr uh, existing or future production in, in countries that are viewed as highly friendly. Shri, I know you and your team also cover the lithium producers. We've seen a, lot, a number of OEMs come in and make equity investments into these producers. And we never would have expected this just a couple of years ago. But do you think we might see the same sort of thing in the copper sector where we see an OEM come in and make an investment in, an, in a copper producer? It's not something that I would rule out. Um, there has been uh, certainly a, a lot of chatter coming from the OEMs uh, as it relates to lithium, as it relates to nickel. And those are just the two commodities so far. Um, it would not be surprising if we are in a scenario where copper all of a sudden becomes uh, as tight as lithium is today. Uh, it would not surprise me to see OEM start to become a little bit nervous at, and then perhaps make some investments uh, here and there to make sure that their security of supply is guaranteed. Shri, as we wrap up, where do you see the copper price going for the balance of 2023? So it's brought, we don't really forecast uh, the price of any commodity. We don't, we don't publish any forecasts, but like I said before, uh, copper is, 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 a, is a rather unique metal right here right now in that the supply of copper is not growing at the rate that it should, uh, but the demand of copper uh, is, is likely to keep growing and perhaps accelerate as electrification starts to take hold. So it's, uh, it's, it's not that difficult to see copper prices and needing to be sustainably higher versus where they are today. And the other thing I'll also point out is that uh, the mine grade of copper coming out of the ground continues to decline. So just because copper is becoming more and more difficult to extract, uh, the price of getting this copper out of the ground uh, does not go down just because uh, as a result of the grade going down, mine, mine costs grow up, go up. So we're likely to see uh, higher prices as a, as a necessity in order to guarantee the supply coming out of the ground. That's a very good point. Yeah, that was a great overview of the copper sector, and I want to thank you for sharing your insights with us today. And I look forward to our next discussion. Oh, thank, thank you for that, Jimmy. Always a pleasure.